but like be adaptable enough but don't seek adaptation i think is people become obsessed with the seeking of adaptation on a more practical level i manage my life with my calendar like my i use my calendar as a bit of a to-do list i manage one step at a time you know if you get a bit more esoteric uh you know it's you know one step at a time or it's like a philosophical answer i manage with with difficulty until i actually started a website for it that's when we really mm -hmm. started to get some traction well welcome me back james henderson to the polymath polycast show this is like the round two polycast so a quicker more rapid fire paced show thanks for coming back on Oh, you're most welcome, Dustin. Great to be be back on the program. Yeah, it's one of those things where I, from the beginning, I knew I was going to have guests come back on. This round two kind of more just like rapid fire, but in very much polymathic fashion, all the round two episodes I've done have not been rapid fire. So I need I might need to change the branding to that a little bit there. Hello, and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. The first thing I wanted to ask you is, how are you doing? Very well, very well. Thanks, mate. Nice to uh, nice to reconnect with you. It's been a it's been a little while. We had a chat briefly, and before that, it was the episode on the on the show, and that was a couple of years back, two, even three years back now. So, yeah, a little while ago, a lot's happened. Uh, yeah, before before we popped on the record, we were having a chat about the microphone. We were talking about our microphones and uh, how things have evolved uh, over time. But this is this is a very old one of mine that. Um, I just use for some online interviews now. We've got a, I got, you, what you can't see behind me, uh, like in this webcam shot, is a whole box of equipment that I've got. So, um, yeah, it's, this is this is a nice old mic that I, I like to come back to. It's the second most popular mic in the world mm -hmm. still. So, uh, for podcasts. So, yeah, really, really glad to, <laughs> to still be using it. But um, that's how I'm doing. That's how I'm doing. Talking about microphones. Well, it's one of those things too where I feel like the Blue Yeti is just the old classic you know what i mean you could always all reliable as they say i think people get a bit too obsessed with uh the technical nature of a lot of things and uh, we might have even um spoken about this before either in the previous episode or or uh over another conversation but i think people get a bit too fixated on the technical nature of a anything is in, in any industry um but but right now we're talking about equipment and i think a lot of people get caught up in in the equipment they use if there are any other podcasters mm -hmm. out there listening this is something that's not overly important to be honest um you know the, the you don't need the latest version of whatever microphone or or, or camera or whatever uh what you know these sorts of things so it, yeah it, it's something that that i i often come back to and recognize that people get fixated on these things so yeah. um you know, hopefully we don't, uh, we don't, dig you know, we do digress. Hopefully we, we, we don't, um, you know, stick, uh, you know, talking about microphones all day, every <laughs> day or advising people, you know, the whole, uh, the whole interview. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we spent the whole time talking about technology, I probably wouldn't mind it either. This show is basically following what your interests are. And if we're both interested in microphones, like might as well, but you made a good point too. A lot of That's new fair. creators, especially. They focus too much on the tech and there is a big difference between like a $30 mic and a hundred dollar mic. And it would be worthwhile to buy, I think a nice hundred dollar mic if you can afford it or save up for it. The camera doesn't really matter that much. You could have a 720p 100%. camera and be it, okay, but your audio is where it's at. Oh yeah. I, especially for a podcast. I just feel like it, it like it limits out relatively quickly. Um, mm -hmm. like you'll you a hundred, two hundred dollars and you're you're good. You don't need to spend a thousand dollars on a microphone. That's just way too much. But yeah, we've been doing a lot more video stuff. Uh, for mm -hmm. anyone out there who's heard the previous episode or coming in on this episode, um Hospopreneurs has come a hell of a long way since we we had a chat last time. Um I'm maybe I'm thinking about microphones and equipment because I'm advising podcasters on what to use. Uh, that's mm -hmm. something that's evolved in the last few years a lot more. So yeah, this is these these must be the things that are on my mind. Front and center. Since the last time you came on, you've moved around, you've worked for interesting jobs, and even expanded your hospitalpreneurs podcast and brand. What have you been doing since the last time we talked? Granted, it has been three years, so I guess try to condense it. But if not, I understand. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to take us back to where we were three years ago, 2020, uh, I was working in, well, yeah, I took a job in banking. Um, I was working for, I won't say the, the bank, but it is 
a very large Australian bank. And to be honest with you, it was it was not fun. I did not enjoy I did not enjoy mm. banking. I was a bit too. We talked about this uh, you and I before recording this podcast. As someone who just who does think outside the box, it it just I was too constrained, uh, stuck at the desk and uh, watch. You know, we have to watch the clock. Like if we didn't if we didn't um, take our break within the the minute, uh, mm. even the second, we were tracked to the second um oh. we would get in trouble so yeah it was it was oh yeah ats uh, was the acronym adherence to schedule but i don't work there anymore i left um took an amazing job as um a, a beverage alcohol rep um for a very large alcohol distributor in fact the largest alcohol distributor in the world called diageo you might be some listeners might be familiar with diageo they own smirnoff kettle one Tanqueray, Gordon's, Johnny Walker, uh, among Bailey's, among many other brands. Mm -hmm. They just bought Casamigos. Casamigos has been uh, doing really well in the US. Uh, Don Julio. Anyway, worked for mm -hmm. Diageo for a couple of years. Loved that job. Rep life was pretty awesome. Get to drive around, make friends, talk to talk to businesses, help them grow their businesses, grow their brands. And then left there to, that was in Brisbane, uh, relocated back to Melbourne where I was just before COVID hit. And now I'm back down in Melbourne. I worked for uh, a company that gets, F they represent FMCG brands. They, they get them distribution in the major retailers. So in Australia, that's Coles and Woolworths. So the two largest retailers, they have the majority of the market. So essentially if you're in one, you're doing excellently. If you're in both and then you're like, you'll be doing so much volume. You'll probably be doing so much volume that it's it's like you could you you'd be doing you'd be doing very well um you could a lot of brands sell a lot of food brands sell when they're doing that that's the kind of end game for a lot of food companies fmcg companies uh not just food so left there and then started focusing a lot more on hospitalpreneurs that was mid-year uh, and i say hospitalpreneurs but i also mean h media that's a y c h h uh that came about from hospitalpreneurs and starting to advise brands on on their their podcast their podcast strategy production editing uh, and that's editing's our really our bread and butter um and so we look after some brands that that have shows and kind of leads us to where we are today um living in melbourne yeah. producing podcasts and including my own so we kind of have a, a flagship show in the network which is my own i've just purely because it's been running the longest and and uh get some some good listeners so that's today. It's quite a journey and it's interesting it too, to journey. think about all the different things you've done in this short time span in the last three years i mean considering what i've done in the last three years too i understand like three years is a long time people underestimate what they can do in a year and some people are overestimated a lot of times, especially polymaths are like, hey, I want to do so many different things. I want to do so many different things. But after you know a few years, it's amazing how it all starts to compound and the things you do, like all these episodes you've done. So I think it's, I think you had the hospital, hospital preneurs podcast whenever we had first talked, but it had basically just started for the most part, I think, back then, right? Three years ago? Possib possibly when we first started uh 2017 was when i launched the show so mm -hmm. may 2017 and then if i was on in 2020 then yeah it, it would have been running for a couple of like three years but there's a lot happened uh a lot that happened in those three years and then a hell of a lot more in the in the in the last three uh, yeah in many ways more but it, i guess like some big changes happened in those first three for example like we didn't when you start out a show, you're, you're not going to get many listeners unless you've got an existing channel you can distribute to. And I've I've definitely seen that in helping brands start shows. So you know if they've got an email database, if they've got a social uh, social channel, social social platform that they can distribute to, they'll get some listeners that'll convert. Obviously, the more people that they have in, ex in an existing channel, the better that they're going to be at at, at getting a, a percentage of those. Well, not sorry not the better that they're going to be at converting, but rather the more likely they're going to have more listeners because they've got an existing channel. So yeah. yes, when we started, we had none. So like I, I had zero. So uh, I was just like my friends on Facebook and LinkedIn and that was about it. And I didn't even share it on LinkedIn at that point until I actually started a website for it. That's when we really mm -hmm. started to get some traction. So um, I definitely found once I shared on LinkedIn, once I started a website, once I 
started really formalizing what the show was about that's when we really started getting some some great guests and great listen and more and great listeners um on the on the show in and around uh what we're doing so um yeah that, that's, that's awesome. that the big changes were really that in, instead of going out fishing like going out looking for guests we had inbound mm. guests uh, like they're just coming in pr companies brands pitching us guests so i just get daily pitches now it's it's a it's a different story like multiple emails a day for stories that they want covered um mm. and so we just have to pick and choose and it's been finding a way to cover as much as we can that we want to cover um that's still on brand um that we can afford but also so too. that's essentially that the, the story of, of it now mm -hmm. so that again sorry dustin oh no that delay is weird uh but also learning how to say no to to somebody's totally totally yeah saying saying no is really important I think that my timeline was a little bit messed up when I was thinking about that. But yeah, I guess because we both started our shows in 2017, but in 2020 is when I started doing all the interviews, obviously for pretty obvious reasons, like everyone was stuck at home. But it is amazing how like the first three years you start to get the experience. I had some content presence before that, but like you, I was basically starting from scratch too, for the most part. And I just started a new series myself where I interview content creators specifically, not so much polymaths, but just creators. And it's interesting how I'm probably just going to keep it on the same channel. A lot of creators think about putting it on separate channels, and stuff like that, but it's still underneath that, that brand. And I think it's going to help too with the whole progression of how quick it grows because it's already going to be on a channel that exists. So yeah, I think it's a good point that you made. Going back to that alcohol distributor company, what have you learned about national supply chains or international supply chains? And yeah, just. Yeah. Well, I've, I've learned the most through the podcast really and i started mm. and when i say the podcast hospitalpreneurs again so the show i started with the perspective that so my background is in economics my formal education is in economics and so i'm always thinking about systems i'm always thinking mm. about how things link up and you know how this connects with this and how does the ecosystem work and so for me, starting Hospitalpreneurs was an opportunity to explore food and beverages to really understand the whole supply chain. So when you say national supply chains, I mean, a lot of it is international, uh, especially with globalization in the last, you know, 30 year, 30, 40 years, certainly really, really changing things, shifting things um, globally, national supply chains. I mean, if you talk about locally um, produced and distributed products, yeah, there, there are like, there, there are certainly national supply chains um, involved and certainly things that come in within the, the system. I'm not getting very granular at the moment, but um, there are certainly supply chains that, that, that don't necessarily include the production of a lot of um, beverages, foods more so produced domestically. But yeah, like what have I learned about them? an incredible amount um what would you like to know more specifically about yeah. uh national supply chains or national or international international how would you like more, to frame the question probably more what i was going for because i love being this global citizen if you will but i do think i think the first time we talked we spent a lot of time talking about economics due to your background a little bit and so that might help a little bit in the case of where that's evolved especially since you've learned so much more about it yeah international uh, economics of supply chains and how since the Swiss Canal kind of issue happened and all these other big issues, what are your thoughts on this, like, this big changes that are happening? Well, I think that there are some, now keep in mind that I, I'm going to preface this answer with, I'm not, I'm not an economist, like I'm not employed as an economist and I don't, I don't, you know, it's not something that I do all day, every day. I have a background in economics in mm -hmm. like formal training in economics uh, and what I see or sort of feel is there's generally a movement to more domestic production. Um, so I'm seeing that a lot of, we've seen this with a lot of the, like local, local movements. Um, a lot of brands are wanting to keep things domestic um, instead of global. We've seen some risks in having international, international supply chains, international production, inter like particularly around uh, logistics, logistics becoming more and more expensive. I watched a really interesting video recently about the possible re, it seems to be some research around this happening. I'm sure that it 
is happening anyway behind the scenes, whether we're hearing about it or not, but introducing like these massive, massive um, blimps that can, that are like, like, I think they're calling them the whales of the sky. They're like these Mm. massive, massive um, transport vehicles to, that'll go very slowly, but, or, but it'll, well, quick. I mean, it's going to go pretty quickly, but not as fast as a plane, of course. And so they'll be able to transport massive amounts of uh, product internationally. So they're fine, trying to find new ways that are cheaper to transport products. Um, but this is not my area of expertise. Um, but you know a decent amount. You know, I know a lot about food and bev, but I have seen, I have seen these sorts of things, ha- I've, you know, seen and read these sorts of things happening. And I guess that, you know, that's something that people are looking to. The, the movement is keeping things more local. Um, mm. And that could be also driven by like the sustainable movement, this sustainability movement. Um, so very much about people are thinking more about um, the earth, thinking more, they're thinking about it. Like environmentalism has sort of changed its, uh, I was going to say vernacular, but more the lens that environmentalism has or the, the, the mouthpiece even that probably not the right word, but that environmentalism has, has changed a lot um, in the years that I've been alive, uh, mm. the last, you know, 30, 30 odd years. So uh, that I have cognition anyway, so maybe let's go 25 <laughs> years, but I couldn't tell you like I'm telling you now when I was five, but anyway, regardless, things have changed a lot. I think it's the movement to more local, um, mm. activity that is pushing supply chains to be more domestic, but that's, that's an observation. Uh, and I don't have any empirical data to back that that's up. That's okay. I think that you kept saying, oh, you're not like an expert in this field, that kind of thing, but like you have a background in economics, you understand that, you've worked in a lot of supply chain, you have some experience in that regard. And given that you're a fellow systems thinker, I just thought that getting your perspective would be key. Just understanding too, from someone who lives across the globe from me as well, seeing what you think. And that's kind of what this show is about, it's like sharing ideas and sharing systems and mindsets. Because one little thing I haven't really talked about in the show, and I don't, I don't mind telling you, is that I want to do written versions of each of the interviews, but I don't want to just do like a transcription and post it on as a blog post and call it a day. I wanted to try to do mental models of each guest, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to go about it yet. And it's been three years into it; I haven't even started. Some guests are obviously, but like understanding what is their polymathic mindset and. Each guest who's come on the show, I think, is pretty polymathic. So what is their mental model? What are they thinking, at least at the time of that recording? Because obviously, it, you change as you get older. <laughs> but now that's why I do it around two, so I can see how your mental model has changed since the first time and that kind of thing. So uh, in, in expressing those mental models, uh, should I fire <laughs> you up about uh, the difference between Obsidian and Notion? Or, uh, oh, gosh. or should we go down another road there, <laughs> Dustin? Well, considering the fact that I moved away from Obsidian to Capacities now, we might as well get into it. We, we didn't have to open up this whole can. Um, that, whole can uh, of I don't know if you've talked about this on on your show, Dustin. Um, <laughs> is this a yes? You're, you're yeah, laughing. I'm not let's sure. Go. Not really. Let's go. Alonzi, yes, we have. Um, Dustin and I have a difference of, of opinion around what platforms to use for these sorts of, sort of ideas, how we model these ideas. <laughs> And I like to use Notion. A lot of people like to use Notion. Dustin likes Obsidian. My brother likes Obsidian. A lot of people like Obsidian. Um, but personally, I uh, I'm, I'm, I like Notion. I think it's good. Um, but I'm interested to know how you're going to map those sorts of models. So have you got any ideas? We don't have to talk about Obsidian and Notion. Let's not go down that road. There are lots and lots of videos you online. The can for of worms. In I'm closing that can of worms. Uh, ah. I wouldn't make that lid back on. Um, but the i was i was going to say there like lots of videos for people to check out the difference um but i'm interested to know how you're going to i'm 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 going to take the seat as the host again uh dustin i've just realized um (laughs) i've just realized i've flipped it on you um but i'd like to know what difference uh sorry what model uh sorry let's start that again Uh, and i don't think it's going to get edited so let's just listen to that whole (laughs) question again in its entirety dustin i'd like to know what platform you're going to use to map those models for the guests? Well, first and foremost, I don't necessarily think I'm going to use these tools per se to to map the models. It's probably just going to be a simple blog post, understanding what the people are talking about. You open a can of worms, I'm going to keep it open. I'm looking at Notion right now. 
Okay. I, I, I want to move from okay. Notion fully. I actually am fully trying to move away from it, but all my guests are in there. All of the shows I've been on are in there. And there's a lot of other things that I have in there that I can't quite pull out just yet. Or I just haven't got around to doing it yet. Obsidian, I actually left because I just couldn't plan my content in it. I, now it's kind of annoying because all of my articles I've saved and all the resources I've saved are now in Obsidian. And so now I have two different places where things are. And then I moved the capacities for all my content stuff. And so now I'm in three different places. When it comes to your question about how I'm going to map the mental models, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, one thing that would be really cool, I don't think I could ever do this, but just as an idea throwing out there in the world for someone to kind of create, is that Obsidian has these graph views where it connects all the little dots. Every page, every note is a dot, and it connects them all together. It would be really cool to see different graphs of different, you know, polymaths that come on the show. But that's just a, you know, fanciful idea. Maybe I could make a simpler version Certainly. of it. I think Obsidian would be a great platform for you to do that through uh, due to that you know, graphic um, interpretation of data. There are probably other platforms. You might have listeners who are very passionate about other platforms that they use. I know that Obsidian does that. That might be one that you like to use. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see. It's gonna take a, gonna take a bit of work to try to yeah. distill the ideas of each of the guests to come up with this this web of information. Uh, so I'd like to see it when you do it. That'd be that'd be cool to cool to look at. Awesome. It's good get to get to some core too. knowledge is essentially. I, I think I'm going to be doing a lot more simpler than what I'm, what you might think I'm talking about. It might just be more. It's like essentially like a blog post, the YouTube description, and then the 10 description is the actual post itself. That way it's good for SEO, but then the mental models can help people at the top. And then I even thought once I make those mental models, I could compile them into a book and that'd be kind of like a tools of Titans kind of book, which would be kind of cool. Cool. I mean, I'm still interested to see it. <laughs> Taking back the reins as a host. I think the podcast, uh, right. also, I do edit these, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. I just wasn't <laughs> sure if that, are you going to cut this out? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I hope so. I, I, I don't know if this will be in it, but hopefully it's cut. What is something that you've always wanted to talk about on a podcast but never got a chance to? Uh, now, like right now that I've wanted to, there's nothing specifically that comes to mind. I started hospitalpreneurs because i wanted to talk about those things i wanted to talk about the things that hospitalpreneurs is about so that's finance business marketing it's about the ideas of successful people in and around food and beverages we talk about food and beverage innovation so that's that's what hospitalpreneurs is about that's what i always wanted to talk about when i say always i mean not always uh not since i was born but it's something that I wanted to talk about for a long time, especially, and we probably talked about this in the, in the interview, uh, uh, the previous interview, but I had a, a tech business that ended up failing. And so that's how Hospitalpreneurs was born. So that's the story of that. Like I, I wanted to talk about those things, started a show about those things. Now that I'm in, in providing this long winded answer about <laughs> not having something come to mind. I've had something come to mind, um, but I have started a, I have started something for it. So in 2019, I don't think I mentioned this on the show last time, but in 2019, I, I had this idea for a show that was talking about death. So talking to people who work intimately alongside death. And I just think that would be an interesting show. I know that there are some out there that do, there aren't. From what I've found, not too many. There aren't too many shows about it. I think it's a very challenging topic in the West for people to accept, you know, unless they yeah. subscribe to deeper philosophical ideas uh, and are comfortable playing with them. So I think that that's, that would be a really interesting show. Um, I've actually launched a trailer for it. It's called Grim. And so that's, that's available. Yeah. The Grim podcast. I think it's, I think I've called it, but um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of ideas that I have for, for other shows that I think would be really interesting. I mean, I'm going to, and I'm going to do that one for sure. Uh, and we've done episode one. I interviewed a, uh, interviewed a mortician. So she was really interesting and had interviewed a mortician. She was super interesting. Uh, and we were going to see how that takes on. I just thought I'd do that for, for six months and, and play around and see what happened there. But my main focus is on hospitalpreneurs and on producing shows for other people. Uh, so I guess talking about death is a, is a really interesting topic that I think would be. Um, valuable for people to to sit and think about 
as a topic of a show, totally agree. I think it's something that's really unique, and I encourage you to pursue it because you can create something that's just not as out there, really. And when it comes to being a more polymathic person, too, we, we generally have these new ideas we want to explore. One thing I wanted to touch on as well is that I do understand that you wanted to talk about this like hospi hospitality for so long, right? I can't say I wanted to talk about polymathy when I was a kid, obviously. I didn't know what a polymath was. I didn't even know that really until I was a teenager. But when I was in middle school, I knew who Da Vinci was, and I knew that he was polymathic. I knew that he was multidisciplinary, and I loved yeah. that. And so even from a young age in that regard, I knew I was interested in this subject. And so that's why I was trying to figure out what that kind of was for you, and I'm glad that you've been pursuing that. And I also just want to highlight for the audience, too, you might have a background in economics, and you have worked with the international supply chains with the liquor company and this foods, but then also too, of course, but a lot of other companies, you created your own business. On the first episode, we talked about how you randomly created this uh, party, big, big party, we can, we can touch on that too, if you want to give people a reminder, but all these different things have culminated to who you are as a person. And that's why I really love this show. That's why I try to do this show is at least the main interviews that we do is a highlight your polymathic life and show each aspect that you do because other shows will only focus on one maybe two out of four to eight mm. and the round two podcast was one more thing this round two podcast is really cool because it gets to kind of give you a comparison to where you were before not only you as a guest but even the guests the people who are watching as well okay yeah cool so well i can't give you a one-to-one -one, um you know, Im imprint of my, of me, uh, I don't mm -hmm. think any individual can ever do so. And especially, uh, you know, people who are interested in a lot of things, it's yeah, very funny. difficult to do that. Right. So, I mean, I, I, things that we may not have talked about in the last episode, I love music. I do. I like, I play guitar. I sing, I've played a lot of different instruments over the years. Um, so audio is something that's really important to me. And I, that could certainly be something that contributed to my interest in podcasting and in, in mm. sound generally in, uh, that background and interest in music. I, I love learning. I love learning about random stuff. Uh, not necessarily like when I say random stuff, I don't necessarily mean just like, you know, like a potluck question. Like I, I'm not, that's, that's not it. I mean, if I'm interested in something, I will try to learn a lot about that thing um and that could be a random thing to somebody else but it has importance to me and so that's why i learn about it i focused a lot of my interests on food and bev uh, dual undergrad and i was working in hospitality and so i was learning about hospitality because that's what i was exposed to that's what I was, and so i became like sort of developed an interest in it um i like a lot of things about the industry there are some awful and unfortunate things about the industry as well and there are a lot of people who talk about the negative parts of hospitality too, but uh, I try to focus on the positive things. I try to focus on the the growth and mm -hmm. and where people can learn, grow, build, where they can move forward. Adjacent to that, uh, and I guess combining the two, interest in hospitality, not necessarily the podcast, but music uh, and 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 sound, or audio. Um, yeah. You mentioned the the city bush doof uh <laughs> or you didn't mention it by name but the event so in australia we have a thing that's called bush doofs uh and so that's d o o f bush uh, the bush uh for those who, who don't know who are listening in america the bush if you're not familiar is like the forest um like it's it's in the wild it's like out in the forest um and so we have the and doof is music it's electronic music so uh, we have these things in Australia that are like wild festivals. Um, they don't have to be like festival festivals. They can be small, but we have these things called bush doofs. Now, for those who haven't listened to the first episode, uh, it, I'm pretty sure we went into detail about this story, yeah. but to summarize we'll it, it um, I accident yeah, I accidentally started a music festival from a Facebook event um, <laughs> that we called the City Bush Doof. And it's essentially the, the idea was that it was a bush doof held in the city. Um, a lot of bush doofs, we had to balance this really interesting um, sort of blend of bush doofs typically being like illegal events. And this was not an, Ill an illegal event. It was very much above board. We hosted it at, uh, at a live uh, music venue. We had a second venue for the after party. It was sort of, if you imagine this, 
forest festival theme, the vibe of this theme, a vibe, vibe of this event. We tried to hold that in a, in a commercial way, in a, uh, you know, an urban environment. So and cool. so that's what it was about having the, the city bush doof. Yeah. I just love that. I, so I had to combine some of those interests anyway. Exactly. You combine interest. I just had to bring it back to, cause this is one of those things where I was just like, ah, oh, that sounds so much fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I didn't want to be associated with anything illegal. It's not, it's not my, vibe i'm not about that i wanted it to be all above board i wanted it to be all all good i wanted i wanted it to be fine but i'm i've never done one since uh and that was six years ago and every year i think man i should do another one i should do another one i should do another one um and i've moved back to melbourne melbourne has more of a an electronic and like an underground electronic music scene um and so i've been thinking of doing something here now that i'm back um I haven't, and I kind of tease it all the time, but it never, it hasn't come back. But I really want it to. I want it to cool. be a thing again. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, th I think I think it will come back one day. What What if I just named the episode title "The Return of the City Bush Do Bush Doof"? <laughs> and that uh, way, like, it'll go viral. I mean, and yeah, you be can like, call what you like. I I I don't. I, <laughs> not necessarily. Yeah, it, we, I think we got lucky with a viral event. Um, on facebook but but i would i mean i would love to have that sort of interest yeah we we i think uh you'd have to listen back to that episode to get the numbers more accurately because yeah. it was a few years ago it was three years before that interview so it was yeah it was a while back now but yeah we we reached hundreds of thousands of people for no spend like it was no mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't advertise we just posted a facebook event that was public and it just went viral so um, that was a real, that was a real ordeal working backwards from there. So moving on a little bit, how do you manage your life at this point with H media, the podcast, uh, different hobbies, all these different things that you're doing. We kind of talked about how you managed it back then, but obviously things are different now as well. What are you doing right now for all of that? How do I manage my life? It's a tough question. <laughs> in, in to, to get more specific with an answer like i mean i i i manage it I, like it depends how what sort of how to frame the answer for you but and i guess it's deliberately broad i mean i, I on a more practical level i manage my life with my calendar like my i use my calendar as a bit of a to-do list i manage one step at a time you know if you get a bit more esoteric uh you know it's you know one step at a time or it's like a philosophical answer i manage with with difficulty you know i i yeah. I, I manage practically um there are lots of ways that i could take the answer to that question but um uh, i i i i started looking at a book that i've got here beside me um i can try to get it for you but this is a this is a great book. I think we talked about it before. Uh, Dustin, uh, you and I spoke about it before being on this podcast interview. But I'll, I'll just grab this book for you now. I'm pretty sure this is a book that you would like. So, this is a book you can't see. There's nothing on the front cover. Uh, it's called <laughs> Existential Psychotherapy. Existential Psychotherapy. Mm. So good. This is so good. Great book. There you go. By Irvin Yalom. I'm not even, I'm not far into it, uh, but this is easily one of the best, sorry, I was to the side of the mic there. This is easily one of the best books that I've opened. So I haven't read it yet. I haven't finished it, um, but it is an excellent, excellent book. And it, it just really combines a lot of um, psychotherapeutic ideas. I, I, again, not an area that I'm trained in, um, mm -hmm. but it, it combines philosophy with psychology and it's it's a it's a it's a book that a lot of psychotherapists um seem to refer to or not a lot but i've met i've met there was a uh, so a psychiatrist uh i met friend of a friend he was like wow was we had this great chat and he's like you got to read this book um because you seem to you seem to be interested in existentialism and also psychotherapy and so i thought i'm gonna read this book it's so good it's dense but really good and at the in the blurb for the book it um recommend it's a recommended text for um psychotherapists practicing or, or or in training so yeah really good book and i'm again not my field but 
of interest. So I thought I'd mention it. Yes, please. Polymaths are insatiably curious. And so we're going to be looking into fields that are completely outside of our particular area of expertise, but that's how it starts. It'll start out small and, you know, it might fester into something big. It might fizzle out. You never know. And that's the whole point of being a polymath is to be curious. And it's also to add more specialties. The reason, um, absolutely, absolutely. And I know that uh, everyone listening will, that'll resonate with them because we are very much like that. Uh, very curious people. Um, this, I bring up this book in particular because uh, you asked me how I manage my life. <laughs> there were some concepts from this book that I've found. Maybe I think it's in the first couple of chapters that have been awesome, really, really good. And it's just, it just because, because it's for psychotherapists, it gives you a very digestible, a uh, very digestible way to bring philosophy into your, your life. Uh, I think that there, there's a bit more eloquent way to describe that, but that I, I just found it was really good. It was really good at, and listeners will have very different ideas uh, around what they believe in. You might believe in some very different things, and I'm sure you do in a lot of ways, Dustin, um, to me. But I found it was really good to introduce like a healthy form of nihilism, which I think was really interesting because mm. um, I found myself getting into a bit of a loop, loop where I was um, oscillating between wanting to find more meaning in things that I was doing and then swinging to the thing that I thought more meaning would be found in and then coming back to, oh, well, if nothing has meaning, why am I doing that? Like, why don't I just do what I'm doing? And then I'm like, oh, but I want to have meaning. And then, and then so swinging between the two, right? And this book had a really interesting way to describe that um, where uh, summarizing it, in essence, it is that the people who are like pushing the case of nihilism are actually attributing meaning to meaninglessness. And that is counterproductive, especially if they, it's actually counterintuitive if they believe in meaninglessness. So what I recognized was meaninglessness itself is meaningless. And so that gave me this liberation that I had been looking for um, mm. that just allowed me to go, oh, I can literally do anything and it's okay. There is no meaning and that's okay. So I just found it really interesting. It was a, I found it was a healthier way to look at nihilism. I just thought it was really cool. So I, I'd, I'd touched on these concepts before in my own thoughts and with, other, and with other people, but I just found it was good to revisit a bit more recently. Mm -hmm. It gave me another recalibration or, or um, reacquaintance with those ideas. I just realigned with that. I can see you're grabbing a book as well, Dustin. I'm looking forward to this. Well... There's a few things I wanted to touch on. First off, I do consider myself quite a bit of nihilist. And I also knew that you were going to be able to give a good answer. And the way you responded made me kind of, I, I had to really kind of put this thought off to the side so I could focus on active listening. But the idea of how much effort goes into the question versus how much effort goes into the answer. So by me giving you a broad question, it makes you as the guest have to think more and expend more mental energy to come up with a cool answer. I knew that for you, and for example, I think this, the way our dynamic is, it was going to be fine. I think I usually am a little bit more specific with some guests because I just figured that's going to help them get to the best answer. But I do love how you were able to bring it to, a, first, first off, a philosophical angle. And I definitely like talking about philosophy on here. And I need to actually relearn a lot of philosophy because I haven't done it. I haven't learned a lot of it since I was 10 years ago, basically, in high school. The book I picked up is something I still haven't fin finished reading it fully myself, but I got most of the way through it. I started, I started rereading it. And the thing is, that's one thing you should do as a reader. Reading it the first time is almost like an overview. Even if you read the whole thing, you're only going to get like a surface level kind of understanding of it. And the more complex the book, the very little that's going to be an understanding of it. So you should always revisit. And I think this, this is one of those books too, The Tao of Physics by Fritjof Capra. Capra who it talks about the balance between science and philosophy. And I think that's a really interesting angle. So quantum physics and Buddhism, for example. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that book. I'll have to look, look it up. Um, certainly the, I, I've heard people talk about, like you just described there talking about 
skimming a book and then and then reading the book um i like to i like to just flick through the book to understand what like what is this tr going to tell me and i'm not that's not like an hour that's like five minutes um mm. less just to skim the book to go what are these chapters what's the story that these chapters are going to tell me that's not in a novel that is in a, a non-fiction book that i am trying to absorb information from and right, i take right. notes on every book that i read so i i will read it and and while i'm reading it it is a detailed read that's not to say that there are that my way is good that's just the way that i do it um and there are probably more effective ways to do it too and again people can get obsessed with the technical nature of these things like the most efficient way to do this thing or the most effective way to do this thing i mean okay um what way works for you your way might not be the most efficient or effective way to do something but if it works for you that's your way and that's that might upset some people uh who no. like to optimize but there's I a mean, concept from oh, um from the 1950s um from a, an well i think he was a behavioral scientist i don't know if he was considered an economist and i think it was the 1950s i have 1956 in my mind but i don't actually know if it is 1956. um there's a concept by a gentleman named herbert simon and the concept is satisficing it's a very strange word satisficing you might be familiar with it it's become more pop popular since uh in particularly since like richard thaler's uh rise uh, he won the the nobel prize in economics before him mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, this isn't um chronological at all here but uh and i don't know the years exactly but we were given some textbooks to read uh, or at least recommended texts in my economics degree and richard thaler was one who was awesome he wrote misbehaving um but before him like kahneman and tversky wrote um did some great work i think it was in the in the 80s um but if you go back to herbert simon th so they talk about these sorts of concepts th that are essentially behavioral economics this concept of satisficing which is contrary to the idea that we need to optimize everything and it's really that you set these benchmarks i'm going to butcher this but I'll, I'll try um to explain it you set a benchmark for the metric that you want to meet before you make the decision and then you go okay once i once i find something that meets that decision is over decision making complete i'm not finding something i'm not looking after that um it's just a good tool so that you're not wasting time yeah in your decision making because we do have this uh choice overload this overwhelm of of options available to us to make decisions uh whether that's in tools or whether that's in products or whether that's in and they you could use them interchangeably but there's so much available to us that you need to find another way or we need to find another way not not you specifically but one needs to find another way to make these decisions so that they're <laughs> offended there dustin um we need to find another way to make these decisions to make them more time efficient um otherwise we could just get caught up making one decision our entire lives right um which is there's so much available so yeah satisficing is the concept i encourage people to to look up that uh, by herbert simon and like modern day people use different terms to describe the same thing uh and like there are there are analogies for it there are there are there are phrases, there are quotes, there are all sorts of things. The concept, the concept is to keep it simple. Uh, like you know, to keep it simple, stupid is another another fr phrase, a quote, or or um, uh, yeah, statement that that people make. But th it's this concept of getting overwhelmed by choice. Uh, one of the one that I used to follow was uh, Ready Fire Aim, uh, a, a guy that I met a long time ago, um, which is just it's the same thing it's you know just just it's a similar thing it's not exactly the same but that's what i would follow around perfectionism that you don't necessarily need to be perfect and we've 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 veered into a conversation about perfectionism not necessarily yeah. about satisficing but there these concepts are all interlinked like optimizing and satisficing versus satisficing um and perfectionism and yeah they're, they're, they're linked but not exactly the same you could find some specific circumstances where they're different but yeah satisficing is is what i wanted to bring up it's kind of like the similarity between serendipity and synchronicity they're not the same but they have some similar uh boundaries 
I was interested too in this mm. idea. I think a lot of polymaths they have this first off decision fatigue. That's always a big deal. And choosing what you want to learn and choosing which path to go forward or multiple paths to go forward. I do believe that people often have multiple ahead or one. It's like just depending on where you are at, at life. And this goes into the hourglass analogy too, which is a whole rabbit hole. But it's interesting to think about satisfying and realizing that if something's already working, right, letting yourself do it. I have one little tangent, then we'll I'll, I'll let you answer. Sorry, there, but the idea of Notion, for example, we were talking about our tools earlier, and the idea of like satisfying. If I had just stuck with Notion, for example, I, instead of moving to Obsidian and then eventually Capacities, it wasn't shiny object syndrome like some people might see it as. It was more of I was trying to optimize it more or finish and accomplish a certain goal by moving to a different tool. But it is interesting to think about Notion got the job done. And you, you mentioned how you work with the calendar. I love the calendar view in, in Notion. It's I lived through that. And as yeah, had I just stayed there, it would have been simpler. Yeah, it gets the job done. What, what yeah. works for you is the is the question. Like, yeah, that's key. Find what works for you. Stick to that. Like it's, it's a really it's a simpler way to look at it. Um, and I hope that that uh, and I say that I mean, there are caveats in that because you don't want to become fixated on a thing and, you know, become distressed or anxious <laughs> when your thing changes. You don't want that. Um, but like be adaptable enough, but don't seek adaptation. I think is people become obsessed with the seeking of adaptation. I think that makes sense. You know, what, what's your goal? Like what, what is your, think about the, what the goal is like, is your, if you're constantly, it's, it's a bit of a hamster wheel. You get stuck in this, running and running and running and running you're like oh the new tool so i can do that thing better so i can be more effective what are you being effective at doing like what is the doing that you're doing so and mm -hmm. i think that that's an important question for people to ask themselves i think that that's that's something that's changed a lot for me in the last few years since our chat that i've become a lot more focused yeah. on more not perfectly but more focused on that outcome like what is mm -hmm. And I say that cautiously because people are like, don't get fixated on the outcome. It's not about the outcome. It's about having an outcome. If you're obsessed with just uh, like mm. adapting, like I just mentioned, I think coming straight after what I've just said there, listeners are going to understand, like you out there listening, are going to understand what I'm saying here. But what is what are you achieving from the thing that you're doing? And that that's the that's the first question. What are you achieving from the thing that you're doing? then you can look at what tools can make me more effective at doing that thing. Right. And I say right. what tools could make me more effective to be good enough at doing that thing, I think is the, the important part to put at the end. So yeah, cause there, there might be another tool out there somewhere hidden deep, deep on the internet that will help you to do that more effectively, but it's not just about doing it more effectively. It's about how can I keep doing this thing well mm -hmm. enough? that it is out there and it's, and it's, it's getting done. Um, whatever that thing is for you. And when I say well enough, that standard of well enough is going to be different in different industries. You know, if you're working with the health and safety of people, that bar is going to be really high, but what tools do you need to make sure that that bar is that high? Mm. Okay. And then there might be some other tools that will make it higher, but you have to meet this benchmark of, satisfaction of quality um right. so that people are safe and happy and healthy and what, whatever that is but if you just you know there are people out there pumping out content that doesn't need to be very high quality and they're just pumping it out and that's okay what tools help you to do that mm -hmm. um you know if you're developing a, a a product like a medical product it's the bar's gonna be high if you're producing some content for a consumer brand they could your bar could be high too but you know, you don't, it's the bar's not as high is what yeah. I'm trying to say. So different products, different industries, different, different scenarios. Yeah. And I think that's a great place to start wrapping up here as well. I think that the lessons you shared today are going to help a lot of people. And I, it's really just seen how the conversation turned out, which is how all these conversations go, it seems like. And I think the lessons you shared actually will help me personally too. Like going back to kind of serendipity, us having this conversation is perfect because I'm, I'm having some of those issues right now and i wanted to ask that's my call to growth is to, is to like you know improve a lot of those things that you're talking about and improve 
my processes. But what would be a call to growth for the audience to do, do you think? Call to growth? Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, I'll lean back into the mic there. Call to growth. Uh, I would encourage people to look at to an inward space within themselves. I think I'm, I'm not talking about anything external uh, for this growth. Like when you say growth, call to growth, I very much see it as an inward thing. You know, look, look within yourself to try to understand the alignment of your goals and objectives, yourself mm. within all of, it's a very big question and a very big, co very, very big concept, but like, I don't have a perfect answer for myself, but it is a quest of my own to be trying to realign, trying to ensure that there is, that I'm on that path, on that trajectory towards those metaphysical, those existential objectives that I have. And I encourage other people to do the same thing because I think that there, it, it creates a deep sense of, of well-being, you know, this, this, or deep, not just a sense of well-being. I think it actually mm -hmm. creates well-being within ourselves to find those answers. They are challenging. They are complex. It's a longer than, answer than I thought. They're challenging. They're complex. They're interesting. I think when we find those answers for ourselves. And so that's my, that's my call to growth is try to find those things. Honestly, you don't even have to tell anybody else your answers to your questions, mm -hmm. but no, know your answers for yourself, I think is, is what's important. Alignment's a huge thing. It's and really level... abstract. And, uh, you know, if anyone wants to message me, I'm happy to, to chat with them about these things. I love yeah. it. And like you said, alignment's a huge thing. Introspection is key to that. And so once again, this is Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator, and James Henderson on the Polymath Polycast round two. Thank you for joining. Innovators crave innovative products, which is exactly why the Polymath Polycast is powered by Riverside.fm.